you. Uh, after the session, it could be uh, several hours after the session, and you're going to you're going to have these sessions recorded available in your detail in your announcements specifically. Then I'm going to share with you my screen, guys. Uh, give me a second. And I'm going to like to remember you some things about the class. We're having our first session. And so far, I have just a few of you in my Be Mine app. And it's going to be, by the way, an excellent way to be in communication. Then give me a second, guys, because I would like to show you some things about the D2L first, and then we're going to go over the lecture. If you go over your class, your section is L505. Uh, this is an online course, then the whole thing is going to be through your D2L. Then you have content, grades, course activities, collaboration. In your content, guys, you have here available your module number one. Actually, I'm going to show you how is your view as student. Then this is going to be your view as student. You have here the announcements. Every single week, we're going to have at least one or two announcements. It's going to be uploading once or twice a week. This was your welcome message. This one, the invitation for the first meeting. And this one was the after meeting uh, announcement and the invitation for this meeting particularly. You can see here, guys, the first meeting uh, recording. Then always you're going to have a post meeting announcement. It's going to be with the uh, information of, of the meeting. And here you're going to have some videos. This video is the recording of that session. I know some of you are working, some of you are, uh, you have family, you have so many commitments. That's the reason you're taking this online class. Then you're not obliged to be here, but it's highly recommended to be here. Why? Because you're able to ask questions directly. And number two, some things uh, are recorded mostly uh, the whole session is recorded and you're going to be you're going to have available these recordings here. Then this is going to be your view content. You can go over the introduction for the course. Then you have several links here, how to get an A in this course, for example, or the syllabus and schedule. I would like to remember, guys, it's going to be better if you already know your syllabus and especially your evaluation and schedule. Then you have here the chapters we're going to be talking about. Uh, our schedule regarding the weeks today, we're going to be talking, as you can see here, about cardiovascular. Um, you're going to have your evaluation is going to be based in four modules, and these are the due dates. Then every single module, you can see here different colors, module number one, module number two, module number three, mo module number four. You have here the chapters you're going to be assessed. Uh, about these modules, and you have here the lab exercises you have to develop for each module. Then, for the homework number one, I'm going to tell you in a minute, uh, you have to build a video. For the lab manual, the lab module number one, you have to deliver labs exercises one through seven. For the lecture exam number one and for the lab practical number one, both of them are, you're taking these exams from here, your D12, and all of these activities, you have to accomplish all of these activities before the due date. In this case, for module number one, it's going to be before March the 3rd. If you go over the content, then you're going to check your module number one. Then here you have module number one, the homework, and you have the instructions here. You have a rubric and you have the instructions here, and then you have Another thing, it says here, look for your name here. Guys, you have the specific learning outcomes for your videos. Uh, for more details, please go over the last session. We have a recording about this, but you have to find your name on this list. If you don't have this list, 
you're not, you don't have your name on this list, then you need to develop this last learning outcome. Describe the lifespan changes in the cardiovascular system. Again, if you cannot find your name in this list, then you have to develop the last objective, the last learning outcome that you have here. It's going to be describe the lifespan changes in the cardiovascular system. That is for the homework number one. Um, and here is going to be the drop box for the uh, homework number one. Then you have the lecture exam. Uh, and it's going to be better if you can deliver homework and lab module first before going to the exam. It's going to be easier for you. Then you have here the lab module. Here you have to deliver exercises seven to one from that manual. Number one is going to be exercise one, two, three, five, seven. Then what you have to deliver, you have to solve every single labeling activity, every single concept map, and every single quiz you have there. Then uh, if you have the hard copy, you can scan these pages and build a PDF, and that's going to be your delivery, the PDF. If you have the digital copy, you can edit each page and you can add for a presentation. At the end, you're saving that presentation as a PDF. And again, it should be only one file for the whole module. Then maybe it's going to be 10 pages or maybe 11 pages or maybe 20 pages. Then all of them should be in only one file, one PDF. And then you have here the lab practical, which is the second exam. Then every single module has a homework, lab module, video, lab manual, a lecture exam, and a lab practical exam. Guys, for the lecture exam, let me tell you something. You have here all the resources. If you go over all the resources, you can see here the PowerPoint presentation per each chapter. Very useful, by the way. And you have here a, a huge help for your exams. You have here the chapter reviews. For example, for this chapter for today, it's going to be chapter 15. And you have here these links with a list of questions. Send of your questions going to come from here. Then you have a list for each chapter, about 100 questions. If you're able to solve these questions with the information that you have in your slides and your textbook, you're going to be fine. And you're going to be able to answer your exams. This is for the lecture exam. And for the lab practical, the most useful resource that we have is the Biology Learning Center at Lonsard College. And it's the first link, the Biology Learning Center at Lonsard College. And you can see here, you have the lab PowerPoints. Your uh, subject is 2402. Then in 2402, for the first lab practical, you have all of these images, all of these slides. A structure of the heart, blood vessels, special circulation. Then all of them were using these images for your lab practical. You have to label images in your lab practical. We're using this image, the same images you have here. We're using those images for your lab practical. Then it was an introduction. Actually, it was a repetition of the last session, uh, just a little bit. And I know it's going to be really useful for you guys. Then I'm going to start with our session about uh, cardiovascular system. Guys, if you remember AP1, you were able to uh, have some organ systems. You were studying last semester the integumentary system, the skin. You were able to study the skeleton or skeletal system. You were able to study your muscles um, the muscular system, but you only study the muscle, which is skeletal. 
you didn't study the smooth muscle or the cardiac muscle, and you studied the nervous system, which is really, really complex. Then this semester, the first organ system we're going to be talking, it's about the cardiovascular system. Then we have two definitions. Cardiovascular system is the heart with the blood vessels. Then we have the pump, which is the heart, and we have the pipes, which are the blood vessels. And it should be important to make a distinction between cardiovascular, cardiovascular, which is the heart and blood vessels. But when we're talking about the circulatory system, we need to add blood. Then circulatory system is going to be cardiovascular, heart and blood vessels, plus our blood. Then this is the first thing, distinction. Then you have the heart, which is the pump. It's a pump. You have the blood vessels. These are the pipes. And the circulatory system, including your blood, your fluid inside your pipe. Then today we're going to be talking specifically about the heart. Guys, the heart is located in your thoracic cavity. Actually, I'm going to show you. Your thoracic cavity has the lungs and the heart. And you have this space here. This is space here where you have located the, this is the thoracic cavity, the whole thing. And you have here, this space, it's called mediastinum. This space is called mediastinum between the lungs. Then you have, when you're a kid, your children, uh, you have here the thymus, is a gland. After puberty, you only have your heart here. And obviously, you have one part of the trachea, one part of the bronchi, one part of the esophagus. This is the digestive and the respiratory system, but the heart is located right here in the thoracic cavity between the lungs and the mediastinum, and it has a bag surrounded the, the heart. If you remember AP1, we were talking about um, uh, cell membranes, and you remember maybe the pleura surrounding the, the lungs, you remember the um, peritoneum uh, surrounding the abdomen, and the back surrounding the heart is called peritoneum. Then we're going to be talking in a bit about that. Guys, for obvious reason, we have to divide our body in two types of circulation. Then we have the circulation called major circulation, which is this one. Major circulation is this one. And you can see here we have a great artery. This is the major circulation, which is delivering blood from the heart to the body and back to the from the body to the heart. This is the major circulation. And we have this one, which is the minor circulation between the lungs and the heart and back to the lungs. Then, because we need oxygen, which is the main function of this uh, blood, deliver oxygen to our tissues, and then back to the heart is going to be picking up this carbon dioxide back to the heart. We use this major circulation. Then we're able to distribute our oxygen and our nutrients, our gases, through the major circulation from the heart to our body. This part is going to be oxygenated blood. We have this blood with oxygen. This is oxygenated blood. And by the way, you can see here, you can see here, we have this kind of uh, circulation. It's on the left side because on the left side of the heart, we have oxygenated blood. Then back to the heart, we have deoxygenated blood. This deoxygenated blood rich in carbon dioxide is going to be coming back through these veins back to the heart. This is the major circulation. Then we use for oxygenated blood arteries, 
and we use for deoxygenated blood, we use veins. For minor circulation, it's going to be the opposite. From the heart, we need to recover that oxygen inside our uh, inside our blood. Then we use for we use for minor circulation. We use for deoxygenated blood. We use our arteries, and for oxygenated blood, we use our veins. Again, it's the opposite. Here, we use veins from the lungs with oxygenated blood back to the heart. And from the heart, because we need to pump blood to be reoxygenated, we use arteries. And normally, we use for every artery oxygenated blood except for the pulmonary artery, which is deoxygenated blood. And normally, we use deoxygenated blood in our veins, except for the pulmonary veins, which is with oxygenated blood. These, by the way, these are pulmonary blood vessels. And these are systemic blood vessels. Again, this is a major circulation, which is from the heart. We distribute our blood with oxygens and nutrients to the body. Then we interchange that oxygen and nutrients. We pick up the carbon dioxide and waste from the body back to the heart. This is the major circulation. Then from the heart to the lungs, we need to oxygenate that blood. We need to get rid of the the carbon dioxide and increase the concentration of oxygen. And then back to the heart, we use veins. Back to the heart, we use veins. This is a minor circulation. Again, when you have systemic blood vessels, you have oxygenated blood in arteries and you have deoxygenated blood in veins. For the pulmonary circulation or minor circulation, you have the opposite. You have deoxygenated blood for arteries and oxygenated blood for veins. Let's see what else we have here, guys. This is the location for the heart. This is your thoracic cavity. Uh, you can identify here the sternum, the rib, and the diaphragm, which is the division between the lungs and the abdomen. And you can see here a cross section of the body. You can see here, this is, remember the anatomical position, and this is the left side and this is the right side. The heart, it's the side of the uh, fist, your fist, and this part is the point or apex and it's pointing to the left. This is the left lung, this is the right lung, this is posterior, this is your uh, vertebral column, and this is anterior, this is your sternum. And again, let me remind you guys, the heart is located in this cavity, which is the mediastinum. This is the mediastinum. And normally, you have here a back covering the heart, which is the pericardium. The pericardium is going to be the back covering the whole heart. Guys, this is the wall of the heart. Then you have here several layers. If we need to study the structure of the heart, this is the wall of the heart. And again, you have here several layers. The back outside, it's called pericardium. Pericardium. This is the back outside of the heart. Pericardium. Pericardium. And you have several layers. The first layer outside is a fibrous layer. And this is the fibrous layer made of connective tissue, high connective tissue. It's really, really hard. It's a fibrous layer. And then you have the serous layer, serous layer. This one is divided into in parietal and visceral. This division between parietal and visceral, guys, this space is called pericardial cavity. Again, you have the pericardium is the back 
is the tissue around the heart. It's like a back, it's a heart back, and it has several layers. Fibrous layer is the outer layer made of connective tissue, and you have an inner layer, which is right here in purple, which is the inner layer, and it's divided in two. The parietal layer is the outer one, and the inner one is the visceral layer. You have a space here, and this space is called pericardial cavity. And why is that space? Because you have some fluid here in this space. You have some fluid here in this space. And this fluid is to avoid the friction, because remember, the heart is always contracting. The heart is always uh, moving. Then it generates friction. To avoid that friction, we have fluid here. Then you have pericardium, which is the external back for protection of the heart. And we have two layers, fibrous pericardium and serous pericardium. And this is divided in two, parietal layer and visceral layer. The space between them is called pericardial cavity and is filled with fluid or pericardial fluid. Now, regarding the layers of the heart, we have three layers, the outer layer, the middle layer, and the inner layer. The outer layer is the same visceral layer, is the same one, the same visceral layer. Then you have called, this one is called epicardium. Then again, the visceral layer of the pericardium is the same epicardium, which is the outer layer of the wall of the heart. Then you have the most important and working layer here in your heart, which is the muscle. And if you remember at the beginning of the class, I told you, we talked last semester in AP1 only about one type of muscle, which is skeletal muscle. This is cardiac muscle. This is cardiac muscle. And the inner layer is the endocardium. You can see here in white, this line, the whole thing. This is endocardium. This one is the endocardium. It's the inner uh, protection of the heart, the inner layer of the heart. And it's made of connective tissue as well. Then, regarding the three layers of the heart, we have Epicardium is the outer one, which is the same visceral layer of the pericardium. We have the muscle in the middle is the uh, middle layer of made of muscle, cardiac muscle, and we have the inner layer, which is the endocardium. Let's see what else we have here, guys. This is the external view. This is the external view of the heart. Again, these is the external view of the heart. This part is called the apex. And this is the point of the heart and it's pointing usually to the left, to the left of the patient. The left, this is the right, remember the anatomical position, this is the left, and the heart is pointing to the left. You have here your left lung and the other side you have the right lung. Then this is the external view of the heart. Then you have here, four chambers. Inside of the heart, you have four chambers. Imagine this is divided in four. Then you have four chambers here. One, two, three, and four. Guys, this is the right atrium. This is the left atrium. This is the right ventricle, and this is the left ventricle. Again, our heart internally is divided in four chambers, four spaces. I'm going to show you in a minute. Here you can see it. Here you have the left ventricle. Here you have the right ventricle. Then you have two superior chambers. Here you have the left atrium, and you have here the right atrium. We have here a lot of internal structures, and we're going to study this better in this view. Sorry, it's going to be in this view. Nice. Then we have now four chambers. This is the internal view of the heart. This is the left atrium. This is the right atrium. This is the right ventricle, and this is the left ventricle. As you can see here, 
the heart is not symmetric. It's really asymmetric. You can see here the heart is not exactly symmetric, but we can divide just to analyze these four uh, chambers. This is the right, this is the left. The superior ones are called atrium, and you can read here right atrium and left atrium. The superior ones are called atriums. And then we have the inferior ones. These are called ventricles. These two are called ventricles. Then we have right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium, right atrium. These four are these uh, chambers or spaces inside of the heart. Guys, this is a pump that we use here in this uh, pump we use here blood then on the left side of the heart on the left side of the heart for both here and here for the left side of the heart atrium and ventricle we have oxygenated blood always oxygenated blood and for the right side here and here we have deoxygenated blood again for the left side of the heart we always have oxygenated blood, blood rich, rich in oxygen, always. And for the left side, we have deoxygenated blood. For the superior chambers, they are called atria. Atria, in plural, it's atrium if it's only one, or atria, it's just two or more. Then in plural, it's going to be atria, and we have right side and left side and for ventricles we have right side and left side this is right and left atria and this is right and left ventricles on the left side always we have left side we have oxygenated blood and on the right side always we're going to have deoxygenated blood always guys this is key you need to understand on the left side we're going to manage oxygenated blood and we're going to manage deoxygenated blood on the right side the other thing i would like to show you guys about the structure of the heart is going to be these pieces of tissues between the chambers and between the chambers and uh, blood vessels. These are called valves. Then imagine, again, we have, if we can use this one. If we have four chambers, we're going to have a valve here, right here. We're going to have another valve here. These two valves, one is located to the left and one is located to the right, between the atrium and the ventricle, and between the atrium and the ventricle. These valves are called mitral on the left or bicuspid. Bicuspid because it only has two parts, bicuspid. And on the right side, we have one divided in three, one valve divided in three which is the tricuspid valve. Then on the left side, we have bicuspid or mitral, and on the right side, we have the tricuspid or tricuspid valve. Then after that, we have between the ventricles and blood vessels, we have two more valves. Between the left ventricle and the aorta, which is the main blood vessel artery in our heart, we have these particular valve called aortic valve. It's called aortic valve, this one, aortic valve, aortic valve. And why? Because it's from the aorta or the main artery in our body. And the other one is this one. From the right side, we have the communication with the pulmonary artery is going to be the pulmonary veil. Then the pulmonary valve, pulmonary valve, 
is from the right side and the aortic valve is from the left side. Then these four valves, guys, you have these atrioventricular valves and these two are called semilunar valves. Their function is avoiding the backflow. Again, the function of these guys is avoiding backflow. Why? Because the blood should be running through the heart in only one direction. It's going to be always from the atrium to the ventricles. Never could be from the ventricle to the atrium. Then in order to avoid that backflow, you need to put here a couple of valves. These two are called atrioventricular valves because they are located between atria and ventricles. And the other two valves between ventricles and blood vessels, they are called semilunar valves, semilunar valves. And these two, on the left side, we have the aortic valve, and on the right side, we have the pulmonary valve. Let's see what else we have here, guys. This is the normal flow. Normally, we receive blood from our body back to the heart through these two veins. This vein is called superior vena cava. This vein is called inferior vena cava. And both of them are draining here in our right atrium. Then again, we receive blood, deoxygenated blood because it's the right side, over the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. And both of them drain into the right atrium. After that, that uh, blood is going to be crossing the AV valve and going into the right ventricle. And because of that, we need to close this valve to avoid the backflow because I told you, it couldn't be, never couldn't be this way. The normal way is going to be always from the atria to the ventricle. Then after that, we close this valve. Then from the ventricle, right ventricle, this is deoxygenated blood. We need to refresh that blood. We need to get oxygen. Then we send this um, blood through the pulmonary vein. And this vein, again, is the only, uh, sorry, pulmonary artery. And this one is the only artery with deoxygenated blood. Then we have two vein, two arteries. One is going to be for the left side and the other one is going to be for the right side because these two are for the lungs. Again, this is for the left lung and this is for the right lung. Then we need to oxygenate that blood. Back to the heart, after oxygenation, we have these four veins. We have these one, two, three, and four veins. And they're carrying back to the heart oxygenated blood from the lungs back to the heart and they are draining inside of the uh, left atrium and then that blood is crossing this valve which is the mitral valve or bicuspid remember because it has only two parts this one is called tricuspid because it has three parts this one is called bicuspid actually let me write it down bicuspid or mitral because it's divided in two parts. Then when we have blood here, this blood is already oxygenated, it's reaching oxygen, then we need to pump this blood to use it in our body. And we use this blood vessel. And this is the main artery that we have in our body. This is the main artery that we have in our body. This is the aorta and it has three portions. Ascending portion, ascending portion, which is this one, ascending portion. Then we have the arch, and then we have descending portion. We have a thoracic portion of the aorta going through the thorax and then the abdomen. And these three blood vessels, they're going to be delivering blood to our neck and head. This is the um, three vessels. They're going to be delivering blood to our neck, to our head, and to our upper limbs. 
and the thoracic aorta is going to be delivering blood in our thorax in the abdominal aorta is going to be delivering blood in our abdomen and lower limbs let's see what else we have here guys this is the view anterior view and posterior view external of the heart guys every single time you have any view of the heart with the apex pointing to the left you're going to be the anterior view if you have the apex pointing to the right it's going to be the posterior view then this is the anterior view and this is the posterior view you can see here again this is the atrium on the right side this is the ventricle on the right side this is the ventricle on the left side and this is the atrium on the left side you can see here the posterior part this is the left ventricle the posterior part this is the right ventricle the posterior part this is the left atrium and you can see here the four veins draining all blood two from the right and two and this of the blood around the two of the blues around the heart let's see what else we have here guys guys this is the structure of the cell if you remember in AP1, we had uh, the study of the tissues and we were talking about tissues, the muscle cell, and you have three types. You have skeletal, you have smooth, and you have cardiac. This one is the cardiac cell and it's different, why? Because you have a branch cell you can see here it has several branches you have striations you have here striations these are striations you can see here all of these striations actually let me increase the size uh these are striations you can see here so many lines here and you have here a division between cells a special division is called intercalated disc between cells then these are intercalated disc between cells again this is the picture of um, a skeletal muscle sorry a cardiac muscle and you have to identify this part you have only one nucleus you have division special divisions called intercalated disc intercalated disc and you have striations these are features of your uh, uh, cardiac muscle this is the cell of cardiac muscle guys if i told you if i tell you guys could you try to stop your heart uh on your wheel it's impossible because the heart is automatic then if you remember the nervous system on ap1 you need to remember the nervous system is divided in two one of them it's voluntary and the other one is non-voluntary then you have sensory and motor and you have something which is voluntary and another one which is involuntary the involuntary one is called autonomic and because it's autonomic it could be sympathetic or part of sympathetic these are involuntary nervous system then because of that we're not able to control the heartbeats we're not able to control every contraction and relaxation of the cardiac muscle it's automatic then we need something to trigger that action potential I know this is from AP1 and you need to remember some things. But if you remember, action potential is the electricity able to stimulate your muscles in order to contract. Then you need some action potentials because you need to contract these big muscles, which is the heart. Then the action potential is going to be triggered by 
the natural pacemaker of the heart. This is the natural pacemaker of the heart. And this one is a group of cells able to trigger these action potentials. Actually, they are triggering always between 60 and 100 times per minute. That is the normal heart rate, 60 to 100. Then again, the heart is able to contract between 60 and 100 times per minute. That is the normal heart rate. And why is that? Because the natural pacemaker, the normal pacemaker called sinoatrial node, it's able to trigger action potentials how many times? 60 to 100. That is the reason when we have more than 100 per minute, we have tachycardia. And when we have less than 60 per minute, we have bradycardia. Then it's because of this we're able to trigger action potential from the natural pacemaker located right here in your right atrium. This group of cells is called sinoatrial node. Then you need to distribute this action potential through the whole heart. Then you're using these fibers to distribute from here to the other atria, to the left atria and the rest of the atria. Then you have a second station here, and the second station here is the AV node or atrioventricular node, or which is the same AV node. An AV node is the second station after the SA node. This one is called SA node, and this one is the AV node. The second station is going to be a delay. This one has less uh, is able to trigger action potential as well, but it's going to be a lesser um, a frequency. It's going to be less than 60. Actually, it's going to be about 30 to 40 times per minute. That is why we don't have these frequencies. We have the heart rate is going to be this one because this one is the natural pacemaker of the heart. But imagine we have a disease here. We have a problem with the, uh, we have a problem maybe with the node in this one. When we have an infarction or maybe we have a disease affecting this group of cells, then we're going to have this one triggering action potentials. It's going to be 30 to 40 per minute times, but it's not enough. That's the reason we're using artificial pacemaker. Um, when this one is not working, we're going to have artificial pacemakers because 30 to 40 is not enough. Then after we receive the action potential here, we need to distribute that action potential through the whole heart. And we use this, which is the bundle of his, or it's called a B bundle. Again, it's called this piece of uh, wire, if you can think of that a wire which is called bundle of his or bundle, AB bundle, AB. Every single time I'm telling you AB, it is, it's because it's atrioventricular. Atrioventricular bundle or bundle of his. This is this piece of wire. Then this is this piece of wire, this piece of tissue, it's transmitting the action potential from the AV node to the rest of the heart. And you have here two uh, branches from the AV node, or from the uh, bundle of his. You're going to have two branches. One is going to be to the left side, and the other one is going to be to the right side. Then you have here two bundle branches. One is going to be to the left side and the other one is going to be to the right side. And finally, you have to distribute this action potential through the whole heart and you're using these fibers. And these fibers at the end of the heart, they are called Purkinje fibers. These fibers are called Purkinje fibers. Then again, 
you need to learn this sequence. The first, the pacemaker is going to be the SA node or sinoatrial node. The second one is going to be the excitation of the walls of both atria. Then you have the delay here, which is the second station for the action potential, which is the AV or atrioventricular node, and it's firing action potentials. Then you have this bundle, which is the bundle of His or AB bundle. Then you have the bundle branches, one for the left, one for the right. And you have finally these Purkinje fibers, and they are able to conduct the excitation, the action potential through the ventricular myocardium. Remember, the myocardium is going to be the muscle of the heart. Then again, you need to learn this sequence because you're going to be asked about that during the exam for sure. Actually, it's for your lecture exam, your lab practical, and your HES exam. You're going to receive these type of questions. This type of information is really useful. I'm going to be talking to you about what is really important to know and what is not so important to know. Um, this one, it's important to know for your career. And sometimes I'm going to tell you which is important for your, only for your exam. Let's see what else you have here, which is really important. This is the action potential. Uh, you need to check again about this. But the action potential is going through the myocardial contraction and relaxation of the heart. Guys, now I'm going to tell you something about the ECG or electrocardiogram and it's one of the most important parts in this session. The ECG or electrocardiogram guys is going to be something you're going to use for life forever in your careers. It could be as a nurse, it could be as a OT, as a PT, as a kinesiologist, whatever you take uh, in the healthcare career, the healthcare field is going to be really important to know the ECG. The ECG is the graphical representation of the electrical activity of the heart. Then I already told you we have electrical activity right here. We have the action potential, but we can represent that graphically in the ECG. ECG, by the way, <coughs> ECG or EKG is the same thing. It's electrocardiogram and it's uh, ECG. Sometimes you're going to check EKG because that is in German. I don't know why it's so popular here in the States, but usually you can read or ECG or EKG. EKG uh, is about the electrocardiogram. Guys, we have several ways or several signs or several graphics to analyze. Then the first one is going to be the P wave. P wave is the beginning of the activity. P wave is this wave. P wave is the first wave we have in our uh, ECG. This is the P wave. And if you remember AP1, we were talking about action potential. And the action potential has depolarization and repolarization. Then we have for the action potential, we have the polarization, and we have later repolarization. Usually, you need to uh, relate depolarization with contraction. And this case, this particular case for the heart, it's called systole. And for repolarization, you need to think in relaxation. And for this particular case of the heart, it's called diastole. Again, for the action potential, you need to think in two type of activities. Depolarization, and you need to associate that phenomenon, that electrical phenomenon with clinical phenomenon, which is the contraction, 
after you have the depolarization, you're going to have the contraction of the muscle. In this case, for cardiovascular, for the heart, is called systole. The contraction of the heart is called systole. And the other electrical event is the repolarization, which is the relaxation of the muscle. After the repolarization of the muscle, should be happening the relaxation of the muscle. And for this particular um, uh, cardiovascular system, we have diastole. Diastole is with A. Sorry about that. It's with A. Diastole. Then we have systole and diastole. Before systole, we have the depolarization. We have diastole or relaxation. We have the repolarization. Then the first wave is going to be the P wave. And this P wave is the depolarization of the atrium. And this is for atrium. Atrium depolarization. This is the representation of the depolarization of the atrium. Then we're going to have here this segment, which is called the PR interval. This is for the contraction of the atrium. It's the systole of the atrium. Then we have here these peaks. These waves. This negative R, which is P. And we have this S. QRS complex. This one, the whole thing is called um depolarization but this time is for ventricles this time is for ventricles guys i'm gonna stop here for a second give me a second i need to stop here for a second i'm gonna stop sharing my presentation um i'm gonna be absent from here uh for an two minutes give me two minutes i'm gonna be Right here, I'm going to stop recording actually, but in now we're recording and I'm going to share my screen with you again. Guys, we were talking about the uh, waves of the electrocardiogram or P wave is the beginning of the electrocardiogram is the atrial depolarization. Then we have here the complex QRX complex, which is the um, ventricular depolarization then this is the contraction for atria and this is the contraction and depolarization for ventricles and this t wave is the repolarization for this is a repolarization for ventricles this is the depolarization for ventricles and this is the depolarization for atria. Then you have here the clinical meaning is a contraction and relaxation. And the electrical meaning is the depolarization and repolarization. Guys, these waves are typical in our ECG. Again, P wave is the depolarization for atrium. The QRS complex is the depolarization for ventricles, and the T wave is the repolarization for ventricles. You have here the contraction of the atria, and you have here the contraction for the ventricles. Then again, this is the graphical representation of the contraction of the heart and relaxation. P wave is the depolarization for atria, and it's going to be contracting our atria. Then we have the contraction for our ventricles. And then we have the repolarization. And after that is going to be happening, the relaxation of the heart. This is the pause between heart beatings. This is the pause between heart beatings. Again, we have the depolarization and then the repolarization. Guys, normally our heart rate, it's about 60 to 100 per minute. Then, usually, if you have maybe a heart rate of uh, 70, we're going to have the whole thing happening in one less than one second. For example, if, if it's 60 per minute, it's going to be 
they're all happening in one second. But it's more than 60. The usual heart rate is going to be about 75. Then you have this is all happening in less than one second. This contraction and relaxation of the heart is called cardiac cycle. Again, the whole contraction and the whole relaxation of the heart, systole and diastole, both together, systole and diastole, all together, they are called cardiac cycle. And this cardiac cycle is the most important event if you are able to understand the physiology of the cardiac cycle, you're going to be able to succeed for this uh, particular chapter. Because the heart, the most important, the most difficult part is going to be the cardiac cycle. I'm going to stop here this. I'm going to move for the next. OK, then you have here the, difficult, the different meanings clinical and electrical meanings of the ECG. Again, P wave is the atrial depolarization. QRS complex is the ventricular depolarization. The T wave is the ventricular repolarization. When you're studying the uh, interval PR between P and QR interval, then you have their, uh, the contraction. You have, you're going to have here the contraction of the atria. You're going to have here the contraction of the ventricles. And here you have the QRS interval, which is the atrial repolarization and diastole. The PUQ segment is going to be the contraction for the atria. And the ST segment is going to be the contraction for the ventricles. Guys, if you are able to interpret the ECG, it's going to be very useful for you for your life. Um, with your ECG, you can know if the heart is working uh, correctly because of the shape of the uh, waves, because of the duration of each segment and wave, and uh, because of the calculation of the heart rate. Then you can calculate the heart rate with the ECG. You can assume if it's the heart is working properly or not. You can assume if you have bradycardia or tachycardia uh, and if it's working or not properly the heart. Let's see what else we have here. Then this is the summary for the ECG. As you can see here, the beginning is going to be the depolarization of two atria. It's going to be the P wave. Then you have the depolarization and contraction of the atria which is the whole segment P, PQ. Then you have this transmission of this action potential through the septum and through the ventricles, and you have the QRS complex, and then the contraction of the ventricles. And finally, you have the T wave, which is the repolarization for the ventricles, and then the relaxation of the ventricles. The whole thing, guys, the whole thing together is called cardiac cycle, cardiac cycle. And it's going to be really, really important for your knowledge here. Guys, several kind of uh, ECG representations. This one, as you can see, it looks normal. And you have here, I can tell you guys because you have one, two, three, four, almost five. Between then, uh, you have to divide 300 by, an, by the number of big squares, and you have here a high rate of 60. Then it's normal and it's regular. You can see here all of these waves with normal shapes. This one, it's called normal rhythm or sinus rhythm. Why? Because this is following 60 to 100. It's regular and you can see the shape of every single uh, wave is called normal. But this one is not normal. Can you see here P waves or QRS complex or T waves? No, you cannot see anything here. It's a mess. It's a disaster here. It's a chaotic um, 
uh, ECG. Then you have here no electrical conduction, no proper contraction, then you're not pumping blood with this one. This one is one of the most dangerous ECGs, is the ventricular fibrillation. You need to apply CPR and you need to, because the heart is not pumping, and you need to uh, defibrillate, you use the defibrillator on this patient because you have, this patient is really close to die. Then you have another, uh, uh, another um, arrhythmia, by the way, these are called arrhythmias. All of these are arrhythmias. These, all of these are called arrhythmias because they don't have normal frequency. It's not normal. It could be less than 60 or more than 100. That is called arrhythmia. And it, because it's not regular, you can see here, you can have here several seconds, different uh, distance here. This is regular, but you cannot see here all the waves. You only can see here P waves, for example, and you can see here QRS and T complex every two or three heartbeats. And this last one, you're gonna have abnormal shapes of these uh, waves. The, all of these are called arrhythmias. The second one, you can see here P waves and QRS complexes, but you have no relaxation for the heart. Then this is called atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is because the contraction of the uh, articles, the, the atrium, it's very fast and you don't have uh, a proper pumping of the blood. Effective pumping of the blood is only for this one. Then you have here another kind of arrhythmias. This is called heart block, which is a, a bradycardia. This one is a bradycardia. It's less than 60 per minute. And you have here something called premature ventricular contraction. And when you have these ones, this one is called extra systole. And when you have more than six extra systole, it's dangerous for the patient. In one minute, dangerous for the patient. Then again, guys, the normal sinus rhythm is going to be the first one is going to be 60 to 100. 60 to 100. It's a regular rhythm. You can see every single shape every single wave normally. And the rest of these uh, representations are arrhythmias. It could be tachycardias like this one, more than 100. This one has more than 100 per minute. It's not effective at all. Uh, you're not pumping blood here. Or you can have bradycardias, less than 60. And you have several types of bradycardias. Let's see what else we have here, guys. We're gonna talk a little bit about the cardiac cycle then imagine guys we're receiving blood on the same time in both atria we're receiving blood on the right side from the body it's going to be deoxygenated blood because the blood is deoxygenated on the right side and we're receiving blood here on the left side from the lungs at the same time then we're pumping blood from the body to the heart and from the lungs to the heart, both sides at the same time. We're receiving blood here at the same time. At this time, we have these valves are open. Then we're gonna have more blood inside of the atria and then inside of the ventricles. In one time after the ventricular filling, then the first step is gonna be the ventricular filling here. I mean, write it down. The cardiac cycle, you have several stages. The first is gonna be the ventricular filling. You need to fill your ventricles with blood. Then you need to contract your ventricle, but this contraction of the ventricles, is a volume isometric, that is, all are going to be closed isovolumetric because they have the same volume inside of the heart 
And the third stage is going to be the contraction of the ventricles, but this one is going to be for eject this, the blood. It's going to be ejection. It's going to be the ventricular ejection. Then you have the valves open and the flow of the blood is going to be through these two arteries. Artery on the right side is going to be the pulmonary artery and the left side is going to be the aorta. Both of them, they're going to have semilunar valves open. And finally, we have the relaxation. Then we're going to have a relaxation of the heart, but this time it's going to be, again, isovolumetric. And isovolumetric because, again, we already have no more blood inside of the heart. We have a, just a little bit of blood inside of the heart, uh, the remaining at the end. And uh, the rest of the blood is flowing through the arteries and veins in our body. And these are the four uh, stages of the cardiac cycle, ventricular filling, contraction uh, of the ventricles, but this contraction should be isovolumetric. Then we have the ventricular ejection because we need to pump that blood out of the heart. And finally, the heart after the contraction is going to be relaxated, but it's going to be with the same volume, the isovolumetric relaxation again. We come back to the ventricular feeling, contraction of the ventricles, isovolumetric, ventricular ejection, and that is going to be every single heartbeat. Every single heartbeat is going to happen in a cardiac cycle. Let's see. Then this is a graphic. It's a really hard graphic. I'm going to let you uh, a video explaining this graphic, but it's again, you need to check these stages of the cardiac cycle step by step. Again, you have here the ventricular filling, the isovolumetric contraction, the ventricular ejection, and the isovolumetric relaxation. These are the four stages of the cardiac cycle, and you're going to have different uh, representation for the electrocardiogram, different representations for the pressure and something which is really important here. As you remember, as you have heard for sure, the heart has some sounds. Then every single time you are able to hear the heart of other person, it's going to be, the sound is going to be like lop up, lop up, lop up. That is the way to contract and relax the heart. Lop up, that lop up, think right about it. It sounds like lob, 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 lob. Every single contraction. Then that lob, lob, the lob, the first sound is called S1. And it's because the AV valves are closing. This is the reason of the sound. The dub, the second sound, which is called S2, is because the semilunar valves are closing. Then again, for every single heartbeat, you have two sounds. S1, lob, lob, dub, lob, dub, lob, dub. The first one is going to be the lob. It's S1 is because the AV valves, the valves located between atria and ventricles, are closing. And the second sound, the dub, is going to be S2. Uh, in This sound is because the semilunar valves are close. Then the first one is AV valves and this, the second one is semilunar valves. Guys, when you hear something else, a third sound, it could be lob dub dub or lob lob dub. When you hear a third sound or a fourth sound, it's totally abnormal. And these sounds are called murmurs. Again, when you have an abnormal sound, it's called murmurs. If you have more than two sounds every heartbeat, it's not normal at all. It's abnormal and it's called murmurs. This is the cardiac cycle, guys. This is the cardiac cycle. Let me check what else we have here. Uh, this is the representation of the minor circulation and what is the origin of pulmonary edema. Oh, this is important, guys. This is the neural control of your heart rate and blood pressure. Normally, 
your heart it's beating by itself because it has the control of the parasympathetic and sympathetic both involuntary both autonomic nervous system then normally the heart is controlled by two centers that we have in our brain if you remember ap1 our brain is our cerebrum or cerebellum and we have these which is the brainstem and the brainstem has three parts this one is the midbrain this one is the pons and this one is the medulla oblongata then in your medulla oblongata you have a couple of centers one is cardio excitatory and what is cardio inhibitory then cardio excitatory and cardio inhibitory then the excitatory one is going to stimulate your heart but the inhibitory one is going to depress your heart then the cardio excitatory center is to increase the heart rate to increase the blood pressure the cardio inhibitory uh, center is going to to decrease the heart rate, to decrease the blood pressure. Then when you have sympathetic nervous system, it's gonna increase your heart rate, your blood pressure. Then you have adrenaline, not adrenaline working. When you have parasympathetic, it's gonna be decreasing your functions, your heart rate, your blood pressure. If you remember last semester, guys, we were using acetylcholine for this one, acetylcholine for this one. Then if you remember the last semester uh, nervous system, you were talking about the sympathetic nervous system is the one for fight or fly when you're alert. If you have a bear in your room, you need to run. Or maybe if you have something uh, which is violent with you, yeah, then you're gonna fight. Then you need the sympathetic nervous system. You are secreting adrenaline and non-adrenaline. On the other side, if you need the parasympathetic is because you need to rest or digest. And then you're secreting acetyl, Calling. Then sympathetic fight or flight is going to be to increase your heart rate. You need to pump more blood. You need to increase your blood pressure because you need to move faster. You need to fight. You're going to be increasing your functions. On the other side, you have parasympathetic. Then you need to decrease. You need to take a breath. You need to rest. You need to digest your food. Then you use this parasympathetic and the acetylcholine is going to decrease your heart rate. It's going to decrease your blood pressure. And then again, here you can see here, this is the parasympathetic and this is the sympathetic. This pathway is for decreasing your functions. These pathways, it's for increasing your functions. Then you have some connection between your medulla oblongata and the natural pacemaker, remember the sinus, uh, the, a, the SA node sinus, and you have some connections between your brain and your sinus in order to stimulate your heart rate and blood pressure. This is the way to control your functions in your, uh, using your nervous system, guys, using your nervous system. Let's check what else we have here. Then you can check here some factors in order to increase your high rate uh, you have uh, these factors to increase your heart rate and to increase the stroke volume what is the stroke volume two de two definitions they are really important i'm going to tell you guys cardiac output is the amount of blood that we have pumped by our heart 
by our heart. Per ventricle in one minute. And the stroke volume, it's the amount of blood in ML, blood pumped by the heart per each ventricle, but that is per each heartbeat. Then the stroke volume is the amount you are able to pump out of the blood, out of the heart, every single time your heart's pumping. And in one minute, that stroke volume is going to be uh, the cardiac output. Again, a stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped by the heart only in one heartbeat. And the cardiac output is going to be the whole volume pumped by the heart in one minute. Then, in order to calculate the cardiac output, you use the stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. Then you have here some factors increasing the heart rate and some factors increasing the stroke volume. Both of them, you're going to have these increasing your cardiac output and you're going to have these to decrease your cardiac output. Again, High rate, normal, 60 to 100. During your stroke volume is going to be about 70 uh, ml. Then normally, this one should be, if we have, for example, maybe 70 uh, times per minute, and we need to multiply this for stroke volume, it's going to be about maybe uh, 4.9 liters of blood. And it's going to be, this is going to be the cardiac output. Remember, these are factors to increase the stroke volume and heart rate. Then if we have, for example, tachycardia, we're going to have more cardiac output. If we have bradycardia, we're going to have less cardiac output. That is an example. Let's see what else we have here, guys. These are some disorders of the heart. And you can... Check later. This is the inflammation of the pericardium. This is the cardiomyopathy. It's an alteration of the contraction of the heart. Uh, this is the endocard endocarditis, which is the inflammation of the inner layer of the heart, the endothelium. This is the myocardial ischemia. This is the infarction, the myocardial infarction. You have the pericardial effusion. When you have a lot of fluid inside of your pericardial cavity, you're going to have a pericardial effusion and some defects uh, on the wall of the heart between the atria uh, on the left side and the right side uh, or between the ventricles. And you have here some common disorders of the heart. Guys, this is the blood vessels and we're going to be talking about that later uh, in another session. This is the blood vessels and normally you can see here this is an artery, by the way. This is a cross section. And you can see here three layers. You can see here the external layer, which is the tunic externa. I'm going to show you in a minute. The tunic externa is this one. This one is the tunic externa made of connective tissue, all of it. Then you have the tunica media, which is made of muscle. This one is the smooth muscle. This is the tunica media. And you have here this small and thin layer, which is the tunica interna or tunica intima. This one is the endothelium. Then you have three layers, three layers in your uh, arteries and veins. You have the tunica externa made of connective tissue. You have your tunica media made of muscle and you have your tunica intima, this one made of only one layer of uh, cells and it's your endothelium. We're going to be talking about that during our next session, guys. This is going to be the end of this session, guys. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing with you my screen. I'm going to stop sh uh, recording this session. If uh, we're having some questions from students and I would like to record these questions because it's very useful material for the rest of us. Go ahead. 
Okay, so in the beginning of your lecture, you said something about um, we needed to know the sequence, but I didn't quite catch that. Uh, are you talking about the sequence of blood flow, like through the heart and stuff that we have to know for the test? Perfectly. You need to know the sequence of the blood flow. You need to remember we're receiving blood from the body. Actually, if you remember, we have two types of circulation. We have major circulation and minor circulation. Major circulation, we need to send blood to the body and back to the heart. And for minor circulation, we need to send that blood to the lungs and back to the heart. You need to know the whole pathway, the whole flow. Then it's going to be starting on the right atrium, uh, back from the back from the body. It, you'll be using the superior and inferior vena cava, right atrium crossing the valve, right ventricle going through the pulmonary arteries to the lungs, oxygenating the blood, back to the heart through the uh, pulmonary veins, and then crossing the valves again, going through the um, left ventricles and then a aorta and the, their branches, and uh, going to distribute the blood uh, to the body and back to the heart again through the veins. This is the whole flow. You need to know this sequence for sure because you're going to have, again, questions no, no, not only for your lecture exam, but for your lab practical and the HES exam. Okay. And then the whole sequence is it's all on the chapter 15 slide, right? Like the, the one that's on your. On the oh, I would like to show you. I would like to show you if you allow me. Let me check again this part. Can you see my my screen now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. You can check here. Yeah, that's First. what I was wondering in the beginning. Like, is that is this particular slide on the V2O? It's in your presentation, actually. Oh, okay. Well, it's in your in your uh, PowerPoint presentation. It's gonna be. By the way, you can see here, this is McGraw Hill material. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah, that's clear. Okay. Again, I know it could be a little bit overwhelming because it's a lot of material, but uh, this is key. I'm going to tell you when the material is key, when it's, mm, it's going to be necessary for life. This is necessary for life. You need to know the sequence. After you learn the sequence, because it's logic, because you're using first the deoxygenated part of the heart and then the oxygenated part of the heart. And you need to understand one part of the heart is for oxygenated, the other part is for deoxygenated. And you have two different circuits or, or uh, circulations, major circulation and minor circulation. You're gonna be able to understand this flow. It's not necessarily more than Memorizing this flow, you need to understand first this flow. Again, this is the four chambers and you have to uh, learn the pathway to flow to this blood flow because you only have one pathway. It's impossible to backflow because of the valves. Then you only have one pathway to learn. Is that clear? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's clear. Okay. Actually, if you want, you can take a capture of this one and your recordings. You're going to have for sure your recording available. It's going to be tonight, by the way. It's going to be tonight. I'm going to let you know with an announcement when you have available your recordings. Any other question or any other comment, any other thing you need to know? Okay, I, I don't think you have any other thing to ask. If you have something, please use the Remind app. It's going to be the faster way to be in communication. Sometimes, because I'm teaching here at Lone Star College several classes and I'm teaching at the uh, uh, Prairie View University, it's going to be kind of hard to answer immediately, but it's going to be less than 24 hours for sure. Instead of the email, it could be 48 or 72 hours. I, I do have one more question on the, the lab ahead. manual on the lab manual. Do you recommend doing like two of the exercises a week or just to just to be on time before the third? Like, what do you recommend on that? Um, the ideal way to go is going to be using your lab manual 
um, with the chapters, with the lecture chapters, but uh, it should be ready before March the 3rd for the first module. And it's a lot of exercises for the first one. The first one is the most difficult because you have there, you have the heart anatomy, you have the dissection of the heart, you have the heart physiology and all of these activities. By the way, I would like to share with you on the screen again because it's going to be useful for you. Most of the things you're looking for, uh, for labeling, you can find these structures in your BLC Law College, your Biology Learning Center. If you use these, uh, 2402, instructor of the art, for example, then you go over these slides and you're going to check these same structures in your lab manual, you have the same structures, you have the same pictures, then these figures are the same you're going to be, you're going to be using for the lab practical as well. And all of these activities, all of these labeling activities, you're going to be able to work with these uh, slides and they're going to be very useful for you, not only for the lab manual, they're going to be useful for your lab practical exam. Is that clear? Yes, that's clear. Nice. nice. Stop sharing with you now. Any other questions or comments or concerns or thoughts, whatever you have? I don't have any questions. Okay. Then we're going to stop the recording now. Guys. It was a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I'm going to be uploading uh, this recording and uh, please try to check your slides before the class is going to be very easy for you if you're able to do that. I know it could be some chapters. It could they could be overwhelming a little bit, but it's going to be easier for you. And remember, these sessions are they are an overview of the material. You need to go deeper on the textbook and the slides. Mainly, you have a huge uh, help, which is the chapter reviews. It's a list of a uh, hundred, kind of hundred questions um, per chapter. And if you're able to solve these questions, you have at least seven or 70 or 75 percent of the exam uh, done. You're going to be able, by the way, to use these reviews during the exam. See you then. Bye bye. Thank you.